Okay, fantastic. So don't put anything personal in there because um, people will actually see it, number one. Number two, as much as I would like to on some level get to know you all on a personal level and be able to answer all of your questions on a personal level, this is not the time or space for that. I don't I don't have time. I also probably don't know the answer. So if you come at me with, um, hey, does my bio 342 class count for this prereq? I don't know. I really don't know. Those are questions best answered in email. Um, so there's that. Second of all, if you're going to type questions in the chat, and that's 100% fine that you do so, please do not address any questions directly to me or Shireen. Um, it's a learning environment here. So if you have the question, chances are someone else in the group also has a question. They should be privy to all of that. Um, I feel like there's another rule that I'm forgetting right now, but those are the big ones. Um, I will apologize in advance. I do need to um, kind of get out of here right at seven o'clock tonight. I have to go pick up my daughter. Um, so we won't be able to run over too much. During this presentation, you are welcome to place questions in the chat. I will, as time allows, go back through those chat questions and answer them. Um, specifically, and then depending on how time plays out, um, if you're more comfortable or it's easier for you to um, raise your hand and turn on your camera and actually ask questions that way, I'm I'm okay with it. So um, I've been lecturing in front of big groups all day today, so we're just, just extending it. All right, so with that, I'm just gonna get started on the PowerPoint. Um, so I think what you see here, Shereen's driving for me, is our mission statement. This is very important to us. Um, I'm not going to read it to you because my assumption is if you've made it close enough to apply to PA school to get here, you can read that. But what I want to point out from this is that we are looking for fantastic individuals who are going to be fantastic advocates, leaders, and clinicians, okay? We, we want to produce people who are really gonna um, kind of impact and change the world, so to speak, not only in our own community, but, but beyond. Okay. Skip, skip, perfect. All right, so what about us kind of stands out makes us special? First and foremost, we are the only physician assistant program for the University of Michigan. There is not a PA program on our, on our Ann Arbor campus or our Dearborn campus. So here in Flint is where U of M houses um, the PA program, so that's exciting. We did start our first class in January of 2021. They are about three months now, three, coming on four months into their clinical rotations, which is exciting. Um, and then our second cohort is just about halfway through their didactic year. And our third cohort has already been um, chosen and will start um, with us in January. So the cycle that just opened up today is for our class of 2026, okay? Um, from here on out, so from the class of 20. 25 forward, we will have 50 students um, per cohort. And then why did U of M decide they wanted to kind of delve into the physician assistant pool? Um, really because one, Michigan Medicine has a ton of APPs that work with them. And I think they saw an opportunity there to kind of grow their own. Um, but also the University of Michigan is very well known for all of its healthcare training programs, and this is just a compliment to those. Up here in Flint, we also have the CRNA school, the, we have PT and OT, um, we have some radiation sciences, we have a lot of things in our College of Health Sciences here up on the Flint campus. This is a picture of all of us. We all love having our pictures up there, but the first uh, first person you see there, that's uh, Professor Gilkey. She is our director. She's been in PA education for a very long time and has been a PA for even longer than that. Dr. Um, Satya Nachani, he is our medical director. He is a, a hospitalist at the University of Michigan in, our, in Ann Arbor. Drew Hilbrandt is usually my partner in crime here. Um, he is our admissions committee chair person. Um, also our clinical coordinator. So he's the guy who decides where our students spend their clinical year. Chastity Falls is um, also one of our professors. She team teaches with me and Professor Little in our patient evaluation course. She is also our academic coordinator. The next one's me. Um, <laughs> then we have Susan Raymaker. She is also one of our professors. She's been a PA for I think about 10 years now. Um, we 
stole her away from Grand Valley. So um, we're happy to have her. She's been in education for a long time. Professor Mike Moore um, teaches in our clinical, our Clin Med or Medical Foundations course. Um, and we're happy to have him. And then Professor Little is our newest um, faculty member, but she's been with us for about a year now and also helps in the patient evaluation course. Um, an overview of our program quickly. Uh, it is 28 months in duration. So like I said, this class that you're applying for now or that's, whose cycle open now is going to be our class of 2026. So they will start with us in January of 2024 and will graduate end of April, beginning of May in 2026. Okay. It's really broken into two separate um, phases. We have the didactic phase or the in-person learning hands-on lab section that lasts about 16 months. So you start in January and finish out in May of the following year. And then the clinical phase, which is about 11 months long, where you go from that May until the following end of March, beginning of April in clinical rotations. And those rotations are um, multiple four to eight week um, rotations at different sites, depending on what you need and when. The last month of the program is what we call our summative evaluation. We bring you back to campus and help um, prep you for boards and make sure you've got your final skills um, check off all complete. And it's really just a prep for the real world time for us. Um, this is, I feel like this is a very busy slide, but it talks a lot about our didactic training. Um, couple things that I like to point out on here, the didactic phase is four semesters, 16 months long, like we talked about. Our program only really has two main courses that make up the majority of your course load. Um, throughout all four didactic semesters, you will have a, a medical foundations course or a clinical medicine, sometimes it's called, um, and then our patient evaluation course. Um, you also have a professional issues course for um, da, 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 three of the four semesters. And in that course, we teach you when you talk about issues that are facing us in the profession. So not only things about how to get licensed, but um, just like malpractice type of things or protecting yourself from um, being sued. I know they've had some um, interesting conversations and guest lectures lately of, of surrounding reproductive rights and um, those sort of things that are out there and important for us. The name change, we've had a couple um, seminars about what that means for us and, and why, okay? You have anatomy during your first semester. That is the only time you have it. Um, it is a gross anatomy cadaver lab. So um, we're really proud of that. And then a fundamentals of disease course where you just kind of learn a little bit about pathophysiology, kind of what you're getting into, how to study medicine and uh, start to apply it all during your first semester. And then during our last didactic semester, um, we do have a public health course as well. Um, we, when you leave here from your didactic year, you will also have your BLS, your ACLS, PALS, and MAT training. We are pretty heavy um, in the procedures, okay? So we teach you to suture right in your very, the very beginning of your first semester, okay? Well, middle to end of first semester, but anyway, right away in first semester, because when we send you out on clinical immersions, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, there's a possibility you might be suturing even during your didactic year. So, okay, um, clinical immersions here. What these are, are basically mini clinicals. Okay, so for some number of days during um, your third and fourth semester, for sure, um, sometimes a little bit in the, the first or second semester, you go out to a clinical site for a few hours at a time and practice your patient evaluation and um, history taking skills. You work with a mentor. Um, the idea is that you go to the same place each time you go and it's five or six times a semester so that you develop a relationship with them. And we really think that this is important because um, it helps having a mentor, someone you can ask questions to outside of faculty, but also all of those, those jitters and nervousness and whatnot that comes with starting clinicals for the first time, um, we get to work those out a little bit ahead of time. So you've got 
a little more confidence when you get into your clinical year. And then we also throw in some additional um, random kind of but interesting and useful trainings like our addiction medicine counseling. So you will actually go to one of our um, addiction treatment centers here in the area and interact with some, some people and um, hopefully learn from that experience as well. Interprofessional activities. So, so um, PAs and really any healthcare provider, don't, we don't exist on islands, okay? We all have to work together to provide appropriate patient care for those who need it. So we have um, a couple opportunities to do that. We do have the College of Health Sciences HEART or CHS HEART. HEART is an acronym. It stands for Health Equity Access Research and Teaching, I think. Anyway, um, eventually it will be a fully operational, hopefully pro bono clinic. Either way, it's a place right now where people can go um, and they're getting PT, physical therapy and occupational therapy there um, pro, on a pro bono basis. And we are working hard to be able to provide medical care um, in that capacity as well for our community. And then local community engagement. Um, the wonderful thing about Flint is there's such a great need here and there's many, many opportunities um, for us to be involved in our, our community and um, provide service learning opportunities for our students. Um, during the first, uh, during the clinical phase, um, you're gone for about 11 months. The clinical sites range all across Michigan and some even up in the UP. Um, currently, we do not have any out of state, although we're not ruling that out just yet. It's just what we have right now. Um, at least some of them, I don't, I hesitate to say a percentage because it varies a little bit by year and by what sites we have. Um, but in the past, we've said about 50% of those rotations will occur at Michigan Medicine. So if you're looking to, to get into the, the big blue hospital um, and see how it works, you'll end up there. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. This is another very busy slide all about those rotations. In general, you have 11 four-week rotations, okay? Um, you have six rotations that are required in our four weeks, including pediatrics, women's health, surgery, behavioral medicine, emergency medicine, and geriatrics. You have two eight-week rotations for family medicine and internal medicine, because above all, we're still um, a primary care-based program, okay? You also get one elective rotation, and that can be anything you want, okay? Any area of expertise you want, um, and we'll try our best to get to in whatever location you want. So there is that. Some of evaluation, I alluded to this a little bit earlier. This is your final month of the program. Um, you come back and you have your last evaluation with our faculty and, and um, preceptors for all of your procedural skills. We help you prep for the pants. Um, we do some pre-testing. You do your final standardized patient evaluations and then um, take the pack rat for the second time. And the pack rat is like a practice pants, a practice board test. Um, just so we can see how you're doing and, and how we think you're gonna fare on the boards. Um, this is the part where we talk about admissions, which I think is why most of you are here. That is our class of, let me look closer. This is our first cohort. <laughs> yeah. All right. So one thing we are very proud of here, um, Shireen and I and and Drew and Stephanie work very, very hard on this holistic admissions process. So what does that mean? That means that we look at all of our applicants as a whole person, every, every part of their collegiate career, every um, part of their academics, but also everything that kind of makes them, them them and unique. So everything from your volunteerism to your work history, to your patient care experiences, to your academics, all of it is reviewed. And the first couple of times it's reviewed, it's all redacted. And what I mean by that is nobody else, I, I can't tell who you are. Um, your name has been removed, your gender for the most part has been removed, where you're from, what's um, what you 
did. I mean, I can tell that you were an MA, but I can't necessarily tell that you were an MA at Dr. Jones's clinic down the road kind of thing. So um, it really gives everybody the best opportunity to be seen on equal footing. Um, and you are reviewed not only by us as an admissions committee um, and faculty, but also by external community PAs. So you kind of have um, at least two chances to really shine and, and show us what it is you're made of. Okay. All right, the requirements are here. These can always be found on our website, but you do need to have a bachelor's degree from a regionally accredited college or university. You have to have a minimum cumulative undergraduate grade point average of 3.0 and a minimum prerequisite grade point average of 3.0. If you're not sure what your prereq grade point is, there are calculators online and you can figure that one out. The other thing I we have to point out is that all prerequisite classes, all courses you want to use to fulfill these prerequisites have to have a grade, okay? Meaning that during um, the initial parts of COVID especially, a lot of classes changed for a while to pass fail. Anything with a pass fail grade cannot be used for a prerequisite. You can have courses that had pass fail, but you can't use those as prerequisite grades. So if that's an issue for you, um, there's a couple different ways we can work with it. Um, usually you can petition your school or send a letter requesting that they actually assign you a grade based on you know the percentage or whatnot in the class that you would have earned. Um, but just keep that in mind. Um, oh, and all of your pre prereqs have to have a C or above as well. Okay. Um, all prereqs must be taken at a regionally accredited institution. Um, all prerequisite courses must be completed before you submit your CASPA application. So that means for those of you who are finishing up um, fall semester, you have other classes to take, especially if they're prerequisite, well, really only if they're prerequisite classes. If you have prerequisite classes that you are taking right now, do not, I repeat, do not hit submit on that CASPA application until January when you have your grades back, okay? Don't do it because we can't go back and fix it. We can't go back and add it in or um, reopen your CASPA application or anything like that. So please do not submit until all the prereqs are completed. Now, if you're finishing out, you know, your senior year and, you know, you're taking gen ed classes or, you know, Spanish for whatever, something that's not a prereq, that's fine. You don't have to have graduated prior to submitting the, the CASPA application, but you must have completed all of the prerequisite classes, okay? Um, if you have questions about what counts as a prereq um, and the course um, equivalencies, I wanted to say course mapping for a while. I've been doing too much ARC PA stuff. Okay. But if you wanted to see a uh, course equivalent, so if you want to see if your bio 320 whatever counts, um, you can go to our website there and there's a um, like a conversion table thing there that will tell you. Okay. Um, admissions requirement, you have to do the CASPA. Okay, or the CASPA application. You also have, did I say this last time, Shereen? Is CASPA spelled wrong on this thing? I miss it every single time until I'm looking at it. I'm like, that's not right. I know. I it, <laughs> <laughs> it is. I have, okay. I'm going to fix it as soon as we're done. <laughs> okay. Every time I do this. Okay. Um, anyway, you have to take our CASPA test. It's not our CASPA test. It's a national test. And this test is one of those like, um, what would you do if it's kind of like one of those behavioral analysis type of question or test, um, but you do need to have that complete as well um, prior to the closing of our cycle. So our cycle now runs from September 1st, so it runs from today until March 1st, and that is every year. So if you're not applying this cycle and you're waiting to apply next cycle, that's fine. September 1st to March 1st of the following year, and it just will keep going like that. Um, for some amount of time. Now, the CASPER test does take a little while to come back. So um, if if you're trying to wait for the last one, the last one is in the beginning of February, right, Shereen? I forget yes. the exact date, but it's somewhere in the beginning of February. It's, um, it's February 15th, I'm positive, or 17th, but one of those days. 
but okay. it's right there. Mid-February. Yes. Okay. All right. Mid-February. You also need to have three letters of recommendation. They can come from whoever you think is going to represent you well. Um, you literally can put anybody in there that you want. Now, pro tip, if I were you and I was applying for PA school, I would um, select people who have some experience with um, my healthcare hours and know what, how I interact with patients a little bit or, or people in the public, okay? Um, we do not require the GRE or the PA cat any longer. And there's no additional application fee. So whatever you, you pay through CASPA, you're done. I mean, you have to take CASPER still, but CASPA and CASPER and you're done. That's all, all the extras. In terms of healthcare experience, we want you to have a minimum of 500 hours of direct hands-on patient care. We prefer paid healthcare experience. Um, sometimes we, you know, look back at some of these things and reevaluate and decide that there may be some other things that count, but that's kind of on a um, case by case basis. Okay. You need to have one letter of recommendation from a healthcare experience supervisor to confirm the hours. Okay. Now, if that person is somebody who's already writing a letter of recommendation, they can embed this confirmation right into the letter of recommendation if it's easier for them. Okay. So they can say, you know, Dr. Jones can write a letter that said, I'm, I'm, you know, Dr. Jones, I've worked with Sarah Guerin at the clinic for approximately 1200 hours over the last three years, and then go on to the rest of the letter of recommendation or something similar. If you don't have that, please, for the love, don't go trying to track down every single person that you've ever worked underneath. You can use things like um, redacted pay stubs. So again, just something that shows the hours. I don't want to see your pay. I don't want to see your social security number. Um, I, nothing like that, but something that'll show hours on it um, will work. Um, other people have wrote in their own, written, written, gosh. Other people have written their own little letters that just say, um, I certify that Sarah Guerin has worked at this clinic for this number of hours and had someone sign it and scan it in um, to the application. There's various ways to go about this. Don't stress about this. I feel like we get a ton of questions and people get really um, nervous or, or anxious about this. It, it's not, it's, this is not the critical portion, okay, of the application. Um, and then a list of what we consider accepted forms of patient care experience can also be found on that website. You're going to hear that over and over again. Look at the website, see the website, refer to the website. It really is all there. Um, so our 2022-2023 admission cycle, which is what we're in now, again, open today, ends March 1st of next year. So it's right about six months in duration. Okay. So you have to sub hit the submit button on CASPA by March 1st, okay? It will then take CASPA approximately two weeks for them to verify all those applications on their end, okay? You need to have taken that CASPA test, it's spelled right on this one, <laughs> um, CASPA test by February 16th, there's the date. So um, make a note of that, flashing lights or whatever in, in your calendar that needs to be done. Okay. That's not the only day. There's lots of days to do it. That is just the absolute last day because it does take them a while to get those results over to us. Waivers are requested by January 15th of next year. Now, two waivers I need to tell you about. The first waiver is what we call our seven-year prereq. Pre um, science waiver. So if you are um, maybe a non-traditional student who has, you know, this is going to be your second career and you did all of your undergraduate science coursework many years ago, um, more than seven years ago, which is our cutoff, then you can use this waiver to have us go back and look at those that are older. Okay. And then we have this last 60 undergraduate credit hours waiver as well. This is intended for students who maybe didn't have the best start to college, but have a steady um, upswing and increase in their grades and their grade point average over time. So this allows us to use just your last 60 credit hours to calculate your GPA so that it, it looks better, looks better, is better overall. Okay. A um, couple of things I do want to say about that. 
your prerequisite grades are your prereq grades, right? So if your prereqs were not included in this last 60 hours, then that won't change your prereq time. Please, please, please don't leave, um, don't leave bad grades in your prereqs on your app. It, it just doesn't look good and doesn't work out well in terms of the grade point average for your prereqs. Um, the other thing is, if we actually do get a copy of really all of your academics. So if, if you use the 60 credit hour waiver, or even if you don't, okay, I can see every time you took anatomy and every time you took physiology, okay? So this is not a like seal your records, erase your past thing. It's just to um, bolster and support your um, grade point average and to highlight the students you are now versus the students you may have been when you started, I guess. Okay. All right. When we talk about our interviews, we did do our first in-person interviews back at the end of May. And um, thanks to Shireen <laughs> and a lot of people, they actually turned out well. It was it was. It was very stressful, um, but overwhelmingly positive feedback from it. It did go well. So when you come into our campus, which we think is important, we want to get you here and, and show you everything we have to offer. You will um, really do three, three to four big things. The first you will interview, obviously, you'll be interviewed by both one of our faculty members and by one of our external or community PAs. OK, again, we always want multiple perspectives on everything. You will complete a writing sample for us. These things are not being submitted for Pulitzer Prizes. We just want to see how you can put um, pen to paper and um, compose your thoughts in kind of a quick fashion. And then there's a campus tour. All right. So our current students will walk you around campus and point out some of the highlights. And then we have a question and answer session um, with our current students and, and sometimes our admissions chair is in there. So um, most of the time I would say they're on campus, you're on campus for like three to four hours, I feel like by the time it's all done. But we're excited to do it. And um, interviews happens usually sometimes late, late May, early June, just kind of depends on how the calendar works out. Okay. All right, champion review. So this thing is, is our pride and joy, but also the bane of our existence, if I'm being very honest. This is how we make sure that the class that we pick is, is diverse and is robust and um, covers all of the attributes and missions and values that we have for our program, okay? And what this means is that each applicant who um, interviewed with us, each interviewee, their file is then um, assigned to one of our faculty members who then kind of pour over it and make their best recommendations about this applicant's strengths and weaknesses and uniqueness and character and all of those things. And we all sit down and like nights at the round table discuss each applicant individually. And that's how we choose who is going to be part of our next class. It is, you are not ranked. There is no like, this person's number one and this person's number seven and this person's 27 and so on and so forth. That's not how we do things here. We are looking to um, fill slots so that we have people who do have really good academics, but we also have people who have really fantastic experience and really good um, resiliency and, and life experience and some who have interesting backgrounds that aren't otherwise represented and people who have leadership potential and leadership experience and um, people who have volunteerism and, and community service and all of those things. So we have to talk about everybody. That's what we do. And it takes us hours and hours and hours to do. But I think that in the end, it is worth the, the process. And um, that's how we do things in our, in our champion process. So we are always looking for what we call transformative people, people that are going to change the world, impact their profession, their communities, their patients, um, just the, the total package. Okay. All right. Uh, this is a general timeline of our admissions policy. Um, 
knock on wood, so far we've been pretty good at staying pretty close to it. But in general, again, September 1st, today, the application cycle open. It closes in March. About March 15th, this CASPA will have finished doing its thing. And April and May will be our big time for application review. Um, people are notified eh, three to four weeks usually ahead of time if they've been accepted for, or if they're going to get an invitation for our interviews. Our interviews happen roughly June. Our goal is to have our class, um, the people we've selected for our class to be notified by mid to end of July. So that starting in like August and September is kind of the background work where we're getting people set up with the university to, you know, like getting your student accounts generated and, and paperwork stuff behind the scenes. And then starting in November, we start bringing you to campus a little bit for some orientation and, and making sure your you know, financial aid is set up and, and those kind of things. And then you'll start in January of the following year. So it's a pretty, I know it seems long, it feels long when you're an applicant, um, but it's a pretty quick process overall. And that is it in terms of this PowerPoint. So we're gonna leave this slide up for quite a while. That email there is, is gonna be your lifeline. So any questions you have can absolutely get referred to that email. Um, Shireen gets most, if not all of them, and she's fantastic at, at, at um, helping you out there. The website is also priceless. Most of your questions can be answered from there. That's where the course equivalencies and what kind of healthcare hours we take and all that stuff is, is there, as well as bios and other things. So I'm gonna look at the chat because it looks like there's a few questions in here, and then uh, we'll go to open questions if, if time allows. Okay, so let's look. Um, we are not still offering the fee waiver for attending this info session because there's no more fees. Um, is there a template of a letter that needs to be signed or can we make up our own for the employer to sign? You can make your own. There's, there's not really a template that I'm aware of. What interview format do you use? It's one-on-one -on -one interviews. So when you're interviewing with a community PA and with our faculty PA, it's it's one-to-one. -one. How are master's programs factored into the application process? Thank you. Uh, we look and we see that you have one, but we don't count any of the grades. The, the coursework does not count. If you do post-baccalaureate without actually being in a master's degree program, we do count those and look at those. Okay, Those do affect your cumulative grades and the 60 credit hour waiver thing. Um, what percentage of individuals in the PA program do the dual degree uh, MBA program? Well, you have to remember our first um, cohort is just now out in clinical, so they're just in their second year. The way that that dual program works is that you complete PA school, so the first 28 months you complete PA school, and then you move into the MBA program for the fine, for the next year and a half or two years. It cuts about a year off of the MBA program and saves the tuition related to that, but I don't know for sure who's applied for it, but I do know, last I knew there were three that were pretty interested in, in very strongly considering it. So it's a, it's a low percentage right now, but um, we're excited to offer it and we think it's a, a good thing and it's definitely there for people um, who are interested. Do you partake in rolling admissions? No, we partake in, <laughs> rolling review of applications, which means that, um, again, there there's four people on this committee, me, Shireen, Professor Hilbrandt, and P Professor Gilkey. And we each read your application many multiple times, okay? So what that means for, and really the ones deciding like, um, like looking to see if you're transformative or if you're going to be the one we offer an interview to and those sort of things, that's really done by just the, the three PAs. So we need time. I can't do all of those applications several times over in like a two week time frame because we're also teaching and, and taking care of our clinical year students and other things. So we start reviewing those files as soon as they come in, but no final decisions about interviews or um acceptance or 
non-acceptance, any of those things, none of those are made until we have every application and every file so that we look at everyone on a plate uh, of um, whew, an equal playing field, an even plane, okay? So it does not matter if you turn in your application on February 28th or if you turn it in on September 2nd, it makes no difference that your chances of getting in or not getting in or getting in an interview or not do not change because you're still looked at as part of the whole application pool. Where would I be able to find the secondary application fee waiver? There's no more secondary application fee. So you don't need to worry about that. What if you master, what if your master's is in biomedical science? Still not counted. Master's, master's period. Doesn't count. Okay. Are prerequisite courses taken at community college accepted? Yes. But with a caveat, because there are some, I just wanted to chime in, there are some that we may not accept. So I recommend once again checking the course equivalency guide that we have. And then you can also send an email with the courses and we can confirm because there are some that um, we, we do not accept. Just depends. No. What type of volunteer work stands out to you as you're reviewing applications? All of it. I think what's important is that the volunteer work that you're doing, what I like to see is somebody who clearly has a... Um, a commitment or a passion or like a, a, a reason or a why for the type of volunteer their work they're doing. I personally, although I'm not saying that this affects your application in any way, but when I look at them, I like to see somebody who decides, oh, like my, my thing is foster children, right? So all of my, or a good deal of my volunteerism and my um, community service activities are related to supporting foster children. Or, you know, maybe it's the animal shelter, like you're you're really into to helping the animals, that's fine. Um, I think that looks a little better than like two hours here and I did, you know, a, a hour at this thing and an hour over there. Um, not that any of that's wrong. It's just a lot of people I think just are doing it to do it because it looks good on a resume or it looks good on an application versus doing it because it's it's like they're calling like what what it's not important to them necessarily I guess okay um can you please send the website for the prerequisite course equivalent in the chat um it can be found on the website there I That's just sent, I I, okay. I just linked okay. it further got down it. got it um if accepted in the program and successfully graduate and receive our PA license, is that license valid in any state or only within the state of Michigan? So when you pass the, the PANTS, which is our certification exam, you use that, that passage, that certificate for that, to apply to life for licenses in whichever state that you want. You have a master's degree um, in physician assistant study, so you should you again, once you pass the pants, you choose where you want your state license to be. Now, if you get a, a Michigan state license, that only that license only applies in Michigan. But some people I know have licenses in Michigan and licenses in Colorado and licenses in Florida and you know various different places. And it it moves around. So okay. is it correct that health science majors from U of M Flint are automatically granted interviews? As long as they meet the minimum requirements, there are some students from some, or there are some programs whose students do get automatic interviews. That does not mean that they automatically get into this program. Okay. They are evaluated on exactly the same um, level as everyone else. And sometimes I don't even know that that's what they're, that's how they got to the interview process until, until it's too late. Okay. They have to make, their impressions, just like everyone else. Is the CASPER test the same for each university? The CASPER test is a national test. So I imagine that every university who requests or requires it, it's the same one. Um, but I imagine that there's also some universities that do, or some programs that do not require it. Right, and if I can chime in. And yeah. then of course there's the snapshot and some universities require it and some universities do not. Currently we do not require the snapshot, but 
um, for all intents and purposes, is generally the same unless a university specifies differently. And I believe they will indicate that if it's different for whatever reason. Thank you. Do we need to upload documentation or verification of all shadowing and healthcare experience and clinical professional experience? Um, no, not all of it. Ideally, as much as you can, but like I said, do not go chasing down some person you haven't seen in 12 years to try to verify that you did six hours of community service with them <laughs> at some point, okay? Um, like I said, there's various different ways to do this. Some people have uploaded like um, past um, like pay stubs or um, they've typed their own um, yeah. little form that says I worked these this number of hours at this place during this year and had people sign that. Um, again, this it doesn't have to be super stressful, but we just need to know that you, you know, people aren't making things up. <laughs> I've seen also like a log as well with the dates and stuff. So that's really also something if you're, you're um, moving from place to place, you could create a document like that and have somebody sign off each time. So you just have it in one, on a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet, and you can always just, um, you know, screenshot it, and there you go. Yeah. Um, someone asked, if you have a low undergraduate GPA, how many credits do you look for to post back to show you're a better or improved student? There's not a number. Um, it's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, and we want to see that there's uptrending grades. Um, we also hope that some of those are in science, um, based courses, because it's not about, it's not all about getting in, right? Part of my job is, is to be responsible and make sure that I'm spending your money wisely, <laughs> because I, we're not, I don't want to just admit pe people that I don't think are ready for the academic rigors of this program. This program is tough. All PA programs are tough. It's, it's not just a U of M thing. PA programs are tough. And the last thing that any of us want to do is to put a bunch of, of students in a position and not set them up for success. So if your academic record doesn't highlight the fact that you are, act, that you are ready for this, that you are um, capable of, of surviving this, <laughs> um, coming out and, and graduating, then then you would you would need to do more, I guess is the best way I can say. But there's not a set number of, of credits or a set amount of time. Um, we do look at things like, are you taking only one course at a time? And if you are only taking one course at a time, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but what are you doing on top of it, right? Because we also look at what other things are you doing outside of the classroom? Because maybe you're only taking one or two courses at a time and you're doing okay, but you're also um, working full time and doing all of this volunteer activities and taking care of your sick grandma. You know, I mean, there's lots of things that go into it. I, it it's too much to say one way or another. It, it just is a very situational thing. Um, can I please discuss the research course that an individual takes during the didactic year? Do you choose what type of research you do? Um, it's part of our public health course and it's a little bit built into um, clinical medicine and there's some um, interprofessional development things that happen there. And it's not it's not research in the way that you, you're thinking about research. It's more about how to look at medical research and determine whether or not it's evidence-based and things we should be following, but also how to um, set up your own research a little bit. But yes, you can, for the most part, choose your own topics within certain guidelines. Are additional letters of recommendations considered, I think up to five? Shereen, is that how many can go in there? Yep, up to five. Okay. Yeah, we require three, but you can upload up to five. Um, are interview invitations sent out in rounds or all at once? Um, typically all at all once. once. Typically all at once. Every once in a while, there's someone who, you know, gets a straggler email a few days later, but that usually has to do with a incorrect email or something, something glitchy. It went to the spam box or things like that. But for the most part, everything goes out at the same time. 
If you took credits in high school at a community college and then transferred them to my transcript at my university, when I apply, would those courses be included into my overall GPA? It depends on how it is set up. So a lot of those courses transfer over as just credit, but not a grade. Sometimes they transfer over as pass fail. Um, again, if you want um, someone to weigh in a little more specifically than that, please email um, the email there and let them work it out for you. How do you document community service hours that were originally undocumented? Are written statements from people within the community you volunteered and um, acceptable? Honestly, this is one of those instances where unless it's a significant amount of hours, I would probably just put it on your CASPA application and not worry, not worry about like documenting it, right? Like I don't expect you all to go to the Relay for Life people from 2011 and have them certify that you were there for five hours. They're not gonna remember, right? So um, do your best, that's all we can ask. And I think I've reached the bottom of this chat. Is there anybody who has any questions they wanna ask in person or now's a good time to throw some questions up in the chat box that I can read? Yes, we have about 10 minutes left, so um, feel free to chime in. This is the, the weird silence, the awkward silence. <laughs> um, um, so Let's I'm just going to ask a quick question. I can just barely hear. Is that Kaylee talking? No, my name is Asifa. Oh, okay. And um, I'm actually at work right now, so I don't have my um, radio on. But um, the question is, I live in Novi, and the drive is about an hour. So during the clinical year, um, do you consider, um, like, placing us into clinical rotations close to our home, or how many times do we, um, you know, go back to campus during the clinical rotation, or is it every day? How does that work? You go back to campus during the clinical year, uh, kind of depends on what rotation you are, but um, usually about once a month, okay? Um, sometimes it'll be once every eight weeks. It just depends on what rotation um, you're just getting off from. Um, and then in terms of where you end up in your clinical rotations, we, we being Professor Hillbrand, <laughs> does sort of take it into consideration like where people live. We don't want people driving four hours every day to get to, to or from a site. We really don't. However, we are also at the mercy of what clinical sites we have available. Okay, and what your schedule requires, what you've already done, what rotations you still have to do. So um, we are in no way, shape or form promising anybody that they're always going to be within, you know, a certain mile from home or a certain drive time. So you are at the at the whim of what we can provide. Okay. Sure. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, any interview tips? I always think be yourself, right? Um, for anything that you're going to interview for, whether it be PA school or a job or whatever it is, I think it's important to always be yourself. I think also it's important that you um, always know a little bit about the place that you're going to interview for and have an idea of why you think you fit into that program or that place's culture and goals and mission and, and all of those things. And really just make sure that that's the place for you. Applying for PA school and interviewing, it's kind of like dating, right? There's There may be a lot of them out there that you like. There's only really one that you want to marry, okay, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, you're going to spend a lot of time in PA school, Monday through Friday, eight to five for 16 months of your life, at least here and pay $100,000-ish to do it. So make sure you pick the right one, okay? Um, 
If I have two degrees and I apply for the waiver, does it apply to the last degree as far as the 60 credit hours? Um, it applies to your last 60 credit hours. So I, if the second degree is a master's degree, then, then no, it won't apply to that. If the second degree is another bachelor's degree or some post-baccalaureate situation, um, then the last 60 are the last 60. Um, is it recommended to work during the program? No, I can't, uh, I can't officially tell you not to work during the program. Okay, that's not within my um, powers to do so. What I will say is, again, you should plan on being in class and or studying Monday through Friday, eight to five, okay? And then most PA students, um, on average, statistically, whatever you wanna say, spend about 30 week, 30 hours per week outside of the classroom studying. So if you have to work, I would hope it would be in something that is going to further your knowledge base, okay? If you don't have to work, you probably won't want to because any additional time you have, you should spend um, with your loved ones, with your hobbies, with doing nothing, relaxing. Um, how much do PAs get involved in clinical research? That depends on what type of PA you are and how interested you are in clinical research. Um, I would say the vast majority probably do very little clinical research, but there are also PAs who do nothing but clinical research. So uh, you can fall anywhere in that spectrum. Okay. That looks like it, I believe. We are. Oh. I'll do specialization. Here's one more. Is it seven? We have five more minutes. So five minutes. Here. Five minutes. How do specializations work for PAs? Um, so pretty much every PA program I am aware of, there are a few, are not for specialties. Okay. Most of them are for family practice or primary care type things. And then you go out and you take your general pants, the general board exam that everyone takes. And then from there, once you graduate and you're licensed and you're going to work, you can work in whatever specialty you want. It is a beautiful thing for um, PAs, that lateral mobility, um, the opportunity to move from one, one special, one specialty. It's been a really long day for me, guys. I, I apologize. From one specialty to the other specialty, um, it, I think it's fundamental to our profession. So if you have a real interest in, I don't know, plastic surgery, right? You can go and you can get a plastic surgery job and, and you can specialize in that all the way down to the nitty gritty specialty of, I only do breast reconstruction, okay? Um, it all depends on where you work and who your collaborating physician is and, and what they're willing to do. On the flip side, if you get six months into plastic surgery and you think this is not the thing for me, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to be a pediatric PA and work in pediatrician's office. Go ahead and get a job there and do that. There are a few um, like additional certificates that um, PAs can get. We call them... Uh, I think they're CAQs or CAHQs, something along those lines, um, that are like a little extra for, there's an emergency medicine one and I think a neuro, neurology. I don't even remember what they are, honestly. Um, very few people actually do them because they value the lateral mobility more than anything. And you still have to um, take and pass generalized boards. Okay. Like my specialty clinically honest, is um, trauma and acute care surgery and surgical critical care, all right? But I've also worked in urgent care and emergency medicine. I've worked in pediatrics. I've, I've kind of done the whole thing. And now I'm in education. All right, we're on a timer, three more minutes. Yes, so this is it. Um, if you have any other questions, now is the time. Normally we would go a little bit uh, over, but it's a small group this evening. And also um, Professor Guerin has a uh, commitment, so. 
All right, it looks like we don't. So once again, thank you all for joining us. And um, if you have any additional questions, feel free to go ahead and send us an email. Usually between now and you know, the next two days after a webinar, we are inundated with questions by email. So just be patient with us, we, uh, we'll get to those. Um, and if you have, um, if you're local to the area, we also have an open house that's coming up as well on September 22nd. You're more than welcome to register for that. Um, it is, I can put the link to the open house to our graduate events webpage where you can register for the open house. We prefer that you register because again, due to COVID and um, certain restrictions with size, group sizes, um, we would like to know how many are, will be in attendance. So here's the link. Feel free to register for that if you're in the area and would like to uh, stop by for about 45 minutes and uh, come on campus and, and speak to our current students as well as um, our um a few faculty members will also be there so and these webinars someone did ask they happen roughly once a month for the next yes. few months and then we kind of take like april may and june off while we're getting our next class seated so mm -hmm. about once a month between now and then you can go to our graduate programs website for the university of michigan plant and i think they have the dates yes up there. At the first of the month. You're my Tyrannosaurus child in the background. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know what he's doing. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. And um, we look forward to, um, you know, reviewing those applications. And here's to a wonderful cycle, 2022, 23. Here we come. Good night, everyone. Thank you.